the benefit of going through this um, this training process is that they're going to be at the top of the list when we get ready to deploy people because they have trained with pace setters and we know that they've been trained by our staff, our trainers. We know that they're going to be, um, they're going to know the concept. They're going to know what pace setters is about. They learn a little bit about what pace setters uh, is about, what we need. We get to know who they are, where they're located, what their desires are. Some people just want to do desk. Um, field or they want to do uh, daily claims or cat claims. So it gives us a better opportunity to, to put them in the right place, place to be successful with pay setters. I'm here with uh, Cesar Sanchez and Sydney Brassfield from the IA firm Paysetter Claim Service. Let's theme this then, we'll theme this one, kind of what the future of the industry is like as you guys see it based on trends and based on you know your thoughts and hopes and fears and dreams and all that kind of stuff i think that's a good topic because that it's just one of those things that i think a lot of people independent of, i mean as you again always going back to social media people get on social media and they basically pull things out of their back pocket and put it out as though it's a fact when it's just an opinion based on you know incomplete information um, so, you know, if we kind of flip the script a little bit and I go to you guys and I say, Hey, pay setter, you're a, an independent adjusting firm. You've been around for almost 25 years. What do you see as kind of the trend, uh, for our industry? What does our job look like in, in a couple of years, five years, a year? Um, what are you guys seeing based on, you know, what do you, what are you projecting based on what you've seen? I believe that. Our industry is moving in a direction where uh, carriers are figuring out that staffing, having staffing models in place to handle the majority of their claims is very expensive. And the desk adjusting piece seems to be something that is coming back uh, as a major force. We are seeing uh, some of our clients that are reaching out and new clients that is the topic of conversation is can you guys handle claims from the desk can we do a combination of desk and field do you have technology that can assist us from the field and then have somebody on the backside writing a claim that seems to be a topic that comes up very frequently and and is can you handle the claim all the way through the process from inspection on the field whether you use technology or not, or you use a conventional approach, but can you also handle that claim from the desk and settle the claim and, and stay with it throughout the life cycle of the claim? Okay. That seems to be the approach. Right, so, so the so traditional adjuster job where we would go and one person would, would get assigned at 40 claims and then you know just keep getting claims all summer long and the next thing you know, four or five months have passed and I've been on one storm. What about those days? Is that, are, are we still looking at a single adjuster, you know, failing the, cl the claim from start to finish? Um, or is it going to transition, do you think, to a little bit more of a kind of split in the role a little bit? So I, I think, I think uh, as far as the field inspection, that's not going to go away because that is, that, are, that is the only opportunity to actually show and live up to the promise that you made to them when you sold the policy. So that piece is still pretty attractive and pretty, uh, it, it's intact. So uh, there's still gonna be the field inspection, but I think the they're looking for more of a robust way to handle a claim on the backside with a uh, desk adjuster and a control environment that can look at coverages and, and can make better decisions, whether it's cover, deny, whatever the case may be, it's just more of a control environment. So yeah, I do see that as a two piece uh, type of uh, approach, uh, but they're looking for one firm to do it all. They're not looking to have half of it, one firm, the other half, a different firm. They're looking to have it with one independent firm handling that process all the way through. And then they have their top of, uh, or the layer of management on top of, of that process to oversee right. the accuracy in the process. So now are you, are you talking about like the carriers having like doing the desk, the desk work and then just like, 
No, well, I'm talking about the IA doing the desk work as well. I'm talking about oh. the desk. The desk piece also is handled by the IA group um, all the way through inspection, the desk side of the, the claim, and the payment process all the way through with one firm. That is something that is over the last six months, we're seeing a big increase on questions about that. Uh, and we have added two new clients that we are currently doing that with, basically a third third party administration system where we handle their claims all the way through. Okay, yeah, and for people who don't know, it's that's uh, that's basically the essence of a TPA, right? That is correct. Are you new to the industry and wondering how you can get started as an independent adjuster with little or no experience? I mean, how can you get any experience if you can't get any experience, right? It's a problem as old as time in any profession. While you may have heard of the IA firm and insurance recruiting specialists at the best IRS, the IRS stood for Insurance Recruiting Specialists. However, the best recently did a complete rebrand that better reflects their company goals, changing their name to the best claims solutions. Because there has been a considerable increase in task-driven solutions requested by the best claims clients, adjusters can now get their foot in the door and gain experience with the best claim solutions, the best inspect program. Not only that, but the best claims also offers continuous training to you, the adjuster, and their compliance department helps keep you current on your licenses so you'll never find yourself hitting the pause button on a deployment while you re-up your licenses. When you sign up for the best claims as roster, you'll be in contact with a dedicated recruiter who will learn more about your skills, experience, and areas of expertise. And once you're onboarded, anytime that there's an opening that fits your skill set, you'll get a call right away. At the best claims, their services are 100% completely free for candidates. Once you're on the roster, you'll have access to independent adjusting opportunities around the country so that you can select what's right for you. Get access to the totally free top five tips for preparing for a hurricane deployment video guide over at adjustertv.com slash the best claims. Watch the top five tips for preparing for a hurricane deployment for free right now by going to adjustertv.com slash the best claims. They throw that word around and they may or may not really understand what that is or what the difference between a I firm and a TPA is, which I don't know that there's a huge difference necessarily. Or... Not necessarily a difference is just how much of the claim we handle, how much of the process of the claim we handle. Um, and, and, and like I said, they're looking for ways to send those claims out and not have to have a staff adjuster full time all year long. If they're not busy all year, they have somebody on the desk, you know, drawing up a, a paycheck every week. This way they can give it to the IA group and it's up to us to, to manage those claims and handle those claims within the, the, the SLAs or the, the standards that they put in place for us to follow. Right, right. So, now, how is how is Paysetter? How are you guys kind of distinguishing yourself in in that in that regard? I mean, what what kind of sets you guys apart from maybe your competitors a little bit with with handling these TPA style claims? So, one of the things that we are doing today uh, is we're taking a different approach. You and I had a a, a brief conversation about training. Mm -hmm. um, we are um, we are going to train our own adjusters. We are bringing the old pace setter tech mentality back into the industry where we uh, bring our adjusters into a, either a training facility or go to them different locations, different states. We are making um, some appearances all over the, the country and we, we are gonna release some dates on where we're gonna have, when we're gonna have this, uh, this training um, modules that we're putting together, they're gonna to be in person. We're also gonna have um, an approach where we're gonna bring it also in a digital form so that everybody can access that. So the biggest difference between us and most of the IA groups is that we are training people. We're going back into the training mode uh, to ensure that our quality is better. Uh, we understand that uh, a lot of them are probably not gonna work for us all the time, but if we improve the adjuster pool as overall, everyone will benefit, including us. So we are looking at, at training uh, anybody that's interested in becoming an adjuster, either field or desk. Okay, yeah, great. And that's, I think, I think that's, uh, okay, sorry, go ahead, Sydney. 
That's okay. Um, something that we at Pace that are really want to be clear about is that we are a firm that new adjusters are welcome at. So we're not only looking for the seasoned adjusters, of course, you know, those are great, but you know, everybody's kind of talking about a lack of new adjusters and that's kind of a big problem that we hear about a lot and that's true, but it doesn't have to be that way. And so that's why we want to focus on training new adjusters and finding out what we can do to make new adjusters feel more confident. And so, you know, asking questions to those new adjusters of what can we do or what could we have done to make this first storm for you go better or to make you feel more confident on your first inspection. And so that's really what we're diving into right now um, to set us apart and to also just, you know, continue to build our adjuster base because we do continue to get busier and add new clients. And so, you know, <laughs> the seasoned adjusters, they're going to run out at some point. We have to train up new ones. Yeah, I think it's a, that's a kind of a perennial challenge in, in our industry is our slowly but surely aging population of adjusters out there. Um, <laughs> And a lot of those guys and gals are maybe not so savvy on the, the gadgets and the, the technology. technology and yeah. yeah. So what is, how does technology kind of fit into what you guys are um, trying to accomplish and what you're, how you're positioning yourself and what you can offer? So as we have already discussed, Matt, we, we, continue to expand our services and our technology uh, with the evol evolution program, the EVO program. Um, we feel like that is a great tool to uh, extend the career. Some of those adjusters that are getting a little bit older, they can continue to do the job they, they love in a different capacity where they're not out there climbing roofs and things like that. And for the new adjusters, we're able to bring them in into an environment that is more control uh, with the navigation app that allows them to, to inspect a loss without really having all that experience that is required you know, in, in some cases. Uh, with that technology, we're able to uh, extract the knowledge from some, some of the older adjusters that want to do just the writing part. And on the, on the inspection side, we're able to train people with real claims with a on-site, on on-hand training uh, concept when they have the app open, basically walks them through the steps on how to how to inspect the locks, um, and then with the savings of time, we we're able to add and train people on the customer service piece, which is a very important piece that uh, over the last um, eighteen months we have discovered that it's more important now than it ever has been because people are hungry for that. Their interaction is gone and, and people want to interact with the human. So that is, that is a portion that we want to also bring back uh, along with the technology. We want to, we want to humanize the technology. We don't want technology to kind of dictate what we do, how we do it. And we feel like this is a good partnership the way we, we structure our, our new business model. Yeah. And I think uh, a, a lot of adjusters are, they get scared because they're afraid that the technology is going to take their job away. But I, I, I you know, you guys probably can, could speak on this. I mean, how did COVID affect, you know, the technology piece and like what it looks like to be an adjuster? Well, I, I believe that technology um, was exposed a little bit. And we, we found out that the technology we have in place today is not as great as we thought it would be, specifically uh, on the customer service side of things. Um, getting a text or getting a, a, a link to click on and, and view your claim and those things, that's great. That's an enhancement to the customer experience, but the real customer service comes with that human interaction. Uh, we believe that that is something that um, we have to make sure that we keep on the forefront of pay setters because that's how we came about. It's always been a customer service experience and great quality. So 2020 and the pandemic kind of highlighted some of the things that we thought we were going to go away. And, and now we know that they're probably not going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, good. <laughs> if you're an auto claims adjuster or appraiser, you already know that SCA is one of the top companies that you can work for on the auto side. But if you're a property adjuster who's never done any auto, you may have never even heard of SCA. But you've heard of them now. SCA Claim Services is launching their property division and they're poised to bring their decades of claims management experience and extensive resources to the property side of things. Insurance carriers already trust SCA because they know they will always receive a high level of customer service and policyholder satisfaction. And with literally millions of claims handled in SCA's four decade history, carriers trust SCA to help them avoid unnecessary costs by handling every claim every time with unparalleled accuracy and a commitment to doing things the right way. I mean, these guys are old school, right? Since 1979, SCA has been exceeding expectations. Only a company dedicated to serving and taking care of people, including their adjusters, can a company like this continue to grow in this industry. Join the team with industry-leading NPS scores and cycle times that has the resources to bring new opportunities for not only auto adjusters, but now for property adjusters. To get started with SCA Claim Services, head on over to adjustertv.com slash SCA. And while you're there, don't forget to download the totally free SCA Claim Services Field Adjuster Gear Guide. Again, that's adjustertv.com slash SCA to download the free gear guide and to apply. I, I, I really, I think I wanna keep kind of pushing into the technology part of it because I think it's uh, it's something that, that again, and kind of I, where I was kind of going with that was basically that the technology enhances our ability to do our job as adjusters, right? Instead of, instead of replacing us. And, and uh, the analogy I kind of, I used and actually was talking to somebody else. <laughs> if think about McDonald's, right? McDonald's has the resources to have like a, a machine in the back where they make the food that there's like one person stands on one end of it and just dumps like buns and ha frozen hamburger patties into it. And then it just, <laughs> it kicks out, you know, wrapped burgers on the other end. They could do that, but they don't. The last time I went to McDonald's when they still had their, you know, their dining rooms open, there was like 15 people behind the counter right? Three people up front and then it, people going back and forth on the, the drive through and then a whole bunch of people in the back there. I don't know if that's, if that's really analogous necessarily, because I mean, food service is kind of a, a people person job. And I think people want to, you know, they, they want to see that there, somebody made their food and it wasn't just like a robot, just like stamp this stuff out. And I think it's the same thing that goes with claims. Um, you know, there was somebody, maybe you guys said this, but it was, um, there's technology when you want it and people when you don't. Who said that? Did you guys say that? I don't think it was us, but I like I it. I think I'm still it. Us. <laughs> yeah, it's ours you, now. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So and it makes sense though, right? Because because like if if you're in a if you're a, a homeowner and you are you have, you know, a section of your fence blows down. That's a that's a big deal to a person, especially if you got a dog or the neighbor has a dog or you have little kids and you, you've got to deal with fixing the fence, right? So any mm -hmm. any claim, no matter how no matter how small, is going to be a, can be a really big deal to somebody. But they may say, oh well, it, the, the, my I, I call the claim and they said just take a picture of it and we'll pay it, right? I'm going to totally do that. But if I have like you know, my dishwasher breaks and ruins the floor and the hole downstairs and the drywall and maybe they have to tear out the cabinets and stuff. I want somebody there. I want to look them in the eye. I want them to be able to make a coverage decision. I want to be able to talk to them. I want to have them talk to my contractor and the water mitigation people and everything else. So I've got to have, I want to have a person there. And I think, you know, you guys probably, it's been a while since I've, when I was at, uh, I was at a staff, I had a staff job for a little while. Um, and we weren't allowed to like phone close a claim that had, had a roof involved. <clears throat> and I don't know if that's still the case or if you guys are finding that to be the case, if you're able to, to close claims with roofs on them. Do you know if that's so, so we're, yeah, we're able to close claims with just about anything, anything on it, but okay. we do have a certain threshold of authority level. And it's more of an authority level based on the money or the, the exposure. Um, but with the TPA concept, uh, we are a direct extension of an insurance company. Um, we do have really good partnerships. Um, 
and they do treat us like part of their organization. They they do um, extend that help, that training, so that we're able to do those those things that you were talking about. We're able to settle claims as as if we were part of their organization. We do have that kind of latitude where we're able to, to have that freedom to to make the the calls on on all of our claims. There you know there's a, a certain amount of money that if the claim goes over this amount, someone else needs to look at it, which is a smart thing to do, and it takes the liability away from us. Um, but um, to, going back to technology, I mean, we can go back to the digital camera. When the digital camera showed up, you know, adjusters, I, my first camera was a um, three and a half floppy disk. I, I didn't have the 35 millimeter, but I had the three and a half floppy disk. Right. And that thing was two and a half pounds. So when the digital cameras came along, um, that's when everybody started saying, well, you know, this is going to go away. Before you know it, they're going to have something else taking photos and blah, 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 blah. And then we get the drones, then we get the the, the um, digital imagery and all that. So all of that is in place, Matt. They could potentially take that if we had a big storm that anywhere in the country, let's say it's a major met metropolitan area, they could take their policy count and say, within this zip code, we have X amount of policies we know every roof is damaged. We know that, you know, it came from the Northwest. We know that two sides of the house is going to be damaged. So why don't we just go ahead and just order that imagery and write an estimate from the desk and pay it. Yeah. Uh, they, they have tried that, that some companies have gone through that process. Um, they find out two things. Customer service went out the window. People that had additional questions about their claim uh, were being rerouted and, and no one really had, they had, they had no control over their claims because they had no idea where the claim process was and they had no one to go to and say, where's this claim at? So that customer piece went away and, and you know, in, in business, if you can't retain your customers, it costs you a lot of money to go get new ones. So they were losing policy holders not because they were unhappy with with the concept of getting a, a roof paid for without having an interaction, but it was the lack of that interaction that was driving them away. Uh, you told me when I bought this policy that you were going to do X, Y, and Z, and one of those includes a fair settlement. I expected someone. How do I know that you're being fair to me? I have not talked to a human yet. All I got was an estimate in an envelope with a check and some instructions on what to do next. What happens next is the expectations. Technology only gets you so far, but it doesn't set the expectations moving forward. All it does, it gets you to the point where you want to be to handle the claim from, from that point on, but it doesn't tell anybody where it's going next. Yeah. And I, yeah, think I mean, that's where the human element comes in. For sure. I mean, and how many, how many phone calls, if, if the adjuster didn't explain depreciation, right? I mean, that generates like, you know, a bazillion phone calls, just that one thing. And if, if somebody just gets a yeah. letter with a check, what's this depreciation? Why don't you give me the whole amount, you know? Four additional touches come after every claim that is not explained on the front end minimum. You have four additional touches that that is already uh, documented and we have it out there. So it's four phone calls, possibly four different people possibly four explanations about the same problem to four different people. That doesn't, for me, I know I'm busy. I'm, I'm not going to take time to do that. I'm not going to be calling or getting transferred and explaining the same issue over, over, and over, and over. About that third one, I'm going to be pretty upset. I'm probably going to be having a different type of conversation with them. So <laughs> that is... that. That is where technology is a little bit short, is that human interaction setting the right expectations. Yeah. So as long as that is there, we will always have a job as adjusters. Yeah, well, I mean, it's you probably it's probably a better business model to be able to put experienced licensed adjusters out there than it is just for somebody to walk around with the phone and just take snapshots. You ever feel like you've been thrown to the wolves by the IA firms you work for, like you're just a number on a roster? Wouldn't it be nice to work with a firm who's big enough to get plenty of work, but still small enough to know you by your first name? Then let me tell you about my friends at the Oklahoma-based IA firm, Paysetter Claims Service. 
Founded in 1997, the thing that sets Paysetter apart is their relentless pursuit of excellence. They hold themselves and their team of adjusters to a higher standard of quality. And now with their advanced all-in-one claims platform called Evo, you'll get a real-time Uber-style map and communication link to the insured, automatic messages sent to customers throughout the process, file review automation, and a fast, accurate scope with Paysetter's partnership with Hover. Hover is integrated directly into Evo, making for a smooth and seamless field scoping experience for you as the adjuster. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. And Paysetter is bringing training to a city near you. Check out their summer tour dates at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter. Well, Matt, empathy, sympathy, and, and sometimes some cases, the biggest event of their lives uh, that affected their biggest investment. Uh, I, I think that human element is essential to, to ensure that they, you know, they get that, that feel good um, sensation that there's a human on the other side that understands that this is a major catastrophe for me and I don't have to rely only on black and white technology that says cover and not cover instead of, you know, let me take a look at it, see what we can do. Let me look at other parts of the policy. Let's see what we can come up with. That human element and that empathy that it'll never be replicated. If, although we're creating this, it'll never be replicated. So uh, I, I can pretty safely say that for a while, I don't think we're going to be replacing adjusters, either field or desk. Yeah, I, I and I, 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 knowing what I know now, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think that because those carriers at the at the highest level they compete on customer service, right? And it's like you said, you just said a minute ago, they it's way more expensive and way more re, resource intensive to go get new customers than it is just keep the ones that you have. So when when a customer when a an insured has a claim, the claims process finished wraps up, they're going to get a, a touch point survey or an NPS, you know, a, a survey where um, the number one of the number one questions is, is, you know, how likely are you to recommend, you know, XYZ insurance company to your friends and family? one to 10 and only nines and tens count. Right. Um, so that's, that's the number one thing that they care about is, is how satisfied the insured. Cause that's, that's the, really the t only the biggest time when an insured deals with the insurance companies when they have a claim. Right. Um, so if they fall down on that it, during that process, or if they have some kid in board shorts show up with a drone or just a <laughs> cell phone and just like, yeah, I don't know, man, just, you know, call your, call your, call your insurance company or whatever. And, no, I'm firing that insurance company if that happens, right? So, I, you know, at the top, the top ten carriers, they all are fighting to, you know, be you know, top five or top three, right? And it's that it's that's where they make the difference is in that people person thing. And and again, when I was at the carrier, they're like, listen, you know, the number one best customer service thing is if you go to the insurance house and you make a coverage decision, you negotiate with the contractor and you, you write a check and you explain it. And you, that's like, we can always get 100s on all, on, for the most part on that kind of thing. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, you have, we don't have the resources, you know, just without IAs to do that. Um, so, and again, I mean, you know, the other part of it, I think is that is, are those gray areas, right? So if you have a computer trying to figure out, you know, well, is this roof, you know, is it repairable or not? Or is this, is this an area where there's there, we could open a window to some coverage somewhere else in the policy to help this person out. That's what a person does. I mean, that's what a good adjuster does. Um, so yeah, I'm with you guys. I, 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 I'm, I'm optimistic. I've, I've heard people say back, it goes back and forth. Like, you know, a couple of years ago, it was total pessimism with everybody and then it's kind of like it does this kind of a deal but i feel like we're back on the we're on the upswing of pessimism or uh, optimism for uh you know how the future looks for independent adjusting um and and i it, and i when i say that it's it's kind of more like not that our job goes away but that there's going to be you know more opportunities for us and i feel like even now there's 
the opportunities are like expanding. Like we're, there's more things for us to do, more opportunities for us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and if I can just, you know, add something to, to the mentality of the, of the adjuster, the field and desk, it's, we don't change the way we want. The last thing we want to do is change as a company. We, we are just like adjusters. We are adjusters. We don't like change and we don't dictate change, but it's basically, you know, they, they say, we're going to change this. You got to do it. And I think one of the things that I would like to invite adjusters to, to be open to is the change. If you're going to be in this industry, be open to change because change is going to happen no matter what you want, what you like, what your preferences are, it's going to change. And you know this because you were, you were an adjuster for a long time. How many things change throughout your career? Oh, man. Almost every year, something changed, right? Yeah. Um, so as an IA company, we are no, no different than an adjuster. We have to change just like an adjuster does to meet the demands of our clients. And, and just going back to, to the technology part and also talking about the customer services is that's really what separates pay setters is, is what, one of the things that separates pay setters is how flexible and how quickly we can change based on demands. We're not the largest, we're not the smallest, we service any level of insurance companies, but we're able to change our model quickly because we understand that we, everyone that's involved with management leadership has had some form of, of um, experience as an adjuster. So when we bring things to the table, it's that adjuster mentality that comes into play where we say, you know what, we got to do this. There's no way around it. We're not going to fight it. We're not going to you know, throw a fit and be complain about it because we might not see another claim. That's how it works. And we, we understand that it is a, it is an adjuster mentality that we have through and through in, at Paysetters on the, on the management uh, level and even on ownership, they all think the same way. So it is nice that we align well with our partners because of that mentality, because we, we are in business to, uh, to bring solutions but we're in business to satisfy the needs of our customers. Yeah, and I think a uh, long story short, I mean, it's when people are worried about the adjusting industry going away. I don't I'm not seeing it a whole lot on social media lately, but you know, it doesn't mean it's not still there. Um, companies are acquiring other companies. Um, they're expanding into new states. They're they're hiring left and right. That doesn't sound like an industry to me that's, you know, on the outs and that, you know, we're fading off into the sunset. Um, so. Well, I mean, with the weather changes, Matt, I don't think that's going to change. So that's what drives and dictates what we do. It's as long as the weather is it's still happening, we're going to have claims. Yeah. As long as we still have weather, which. You know, plus there's always, there's more people but right now. We're in this big construction boom. Everybody's building, there's new houses are being thrown up all over the place. I mean, it's not going to, the insurance industry is not going away. It's all, I mean, it's been around for 500 years now, something like that, 450 yep. years, yep. since 1600s. Um, they, yeah, we've had, they started insuring tea. They were insuring the goods that went back and forth from England yeah. back to the United States. Yeah, that's that's how it got started. So it's been around for a while. Yeah, it's it's uh it's a it's actually it's nerdy, but it's kind of fascinating. <laughs> yes, I know, and and I don't really break it out that often because I don't want to drive people away from me. They think right. I'm cool uh, right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> so so you had mentioned earlier that um Paysetter was really kind of kind of push into training, and you talked about doing like like remote training as well as um, sort of like in-person training where you go to, to uh, come to us. So kind of what does that look like for you guys? And, and like, what can adjusters expect from that kind of training? Yeah. So we're actually, we're working on several different courses and we just did a desk, two different desk training, desk adjuster training courses last week in Florida um, in two different locations. And so 
a lot of adjusters are familiar with um, the pay setter tech that we kind of started with where adjusters had to come to Catoosa, Oklahoma and stay for however long, you know, the training went on and that it was very successful and it was great, very popular. Um, but especially now with the climate of how things are, not everybody wants to travel and especially, you know, not to Catoosa, Oklahoma. <laughs> so, um, you know, not the most interesting place. So, um, what we're doing now is we're really just kind of going on tour, so to speak, to just different um, popular locations. And so I know we're going to be going to Dallas soon. We were just in Orlando and Tampa. And there's just different locations that we are going to be going to to kind of go to the adjuster. And they may still have to travel, you know, a little bit, but not as much as they would have. And so that's for those adjusters that really do still want that in-person training, because a lot of them do. They, they do want to go sit in that kind of more traditional classroom style training and physically meet someone and, and watch someone present um, the material, but not everyone wants to do that or can do that. And so we're also going to be doing uh, virtual training, like Cesar mentioned, um, probably going to be like via Zoom or Microsoft Teams or something like that to where they can have access to the same information, but without having to go and physically be um, on site, if that's not what they're wanting to do or able to do. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. The benefit of going through this, um, this training process is that they're going to be at the top of the list when we get ready to deploy people because they have trained with pay setters and we know that they've been trained by our staff, our trainers. We know that they're going to be, um, they're going to know the concept. They're going to know what pay setters is about. They learn a little bit about what pay setters uh, is about, what we need. Um, we don't go into the specifics of the, the carrier. We, it's an overall kind of one size fits all type of deal. At the beginning, we get to know who they are, where they're located, what their desires are. Some people just want to do desk um, field or they want to do uh, daily claims or cat claims. So it gives us a better opportunity to, to put them in the right place, place to be successful with pay setters. So it is a, um, it does have benefits and, and we're also looking at down the road where we're gonna have, we're gonna give them a little more value on this training as we as we um, grow into this training uh, process. We're gonna be able to, to give them a certificate of training for desk adjust, whatever the case may be with pay setters, not with a specific carrier, but with pay setters, it'll carry value. So when we have those big events, we can say, okay, we, we had 150 people that showed up to our training. We have all their information available. Those are the first ones that are going to get that phone call to be deployed, to be uh, employed by pay setters. Yeah. So basically it's, it's, it's a low cost or, or basically free, free ish. Um, and it has the benefit of um, being a little bit more of a generic training, which is, I think, is a little bit unique in the in the industry. I think most most firms are are going to train to a, a carrier certification, but you guys certainly do that as well. Um, and then probably not a bad networking opportunity, you know, especially Absolutely. the in person yes. ones. You can. Kind of go take, you know, oh, let's take 15 minutes. You guys go stretch and get a drink or whatever. And go into the front of the room to talk to the instructor and say, hey, my name's Matt. And that's what I always did at those things. Um, that's exactly what it's intended to do. Well, yeah. and something that was, 
something that was really cool that I saw happen at, um, after one of the days of our training, we had what we call a meet and greet, which is just essentially adjusters can come and just kind of hang out with us. They can learn about pace better. We can kind of get to know them. And so there was a seasoned adjuster that was there and a brand new person who was wanting to become an adjuster. And he had previously, he was a banker. So, I mean, completely different you know, industry. Um, and they actually kind of worked it out to where he was going to shadow this other adjuster on some of his claims. So, you know, that, that meeting probably would have never happened had, had they not both been at that, that place. And so that was something that was really cool and networking for them, which, you know, hopefully he'll join our roster and he'll be a pace setter adjuster. But if not, that still helped him. For sure. And and I think that that's, you know, a lot of adjusters, they, they or, or, or new folks, they may not really recognize this or understand this, but a lot of the time, whenever I hear about, you know, you know, uh, deployment is if a buddy of mine texts me like, Hey, I just got called by so-and-so, um, you know, there was big hail wherever, right. You better call in or whatever. And especially in the very beginning when you kind of, you're supporting each other, like, Hey, so it's, you know, such, such firm just called me and I'm going to Chicago. Um, they said, if you know anybody to have them call, right. That's, I mean, if you know, like, three adjusters or two adjust other adjusters, especially ones that are a level or, you know, you're, you're a two or three in experience above you. It's priceless because you hear about those little small deployments that, you know, the rank and file out there who are just throwing resumes out and then not following up or not going to these training things, they're never going to hear about. And they're going to, then they're going to get on social media and complain about how this job sucks and they never got work and <laughs> I, you know, whatever, which I mean, come on. Um, and the other thing is, and, I, and and you guys, you know, can confirm or deny this, but in those trainings, I would imagine, especially in the in-person trainings, you're probably watching, you're looking at those folks and you're saying that young woman right there, she's, it's clicking. I can see it clicking on her face. She's asking good questions. You know, let's, let's make a note of her. Right. So you guys are probably using that as an, as a, as a way to kind of, you know, find new new hot shot talent, so to speak. It's an informal interview. It's an informal interview uh, while you're taking directions from a trainer, right? Which is what we do every day. So if you're not able to follow directions or pay attention to somebody, we know that maybe this is not the job for you if you're on social media while somebody's up there doing uh, doing their presentation. So it is an informal interview, absolutely. Um, another thing that that I want to also kind of touch on is that the training that we do when we, we're going to sites, we don't do it carrier specific. Is the reason for that is because by the time we called you, you're probably not going to remember uh, what that carrier needs. So when we bring you back, that's when we dive into the specifics of the carriers fresh in your mind, you're about to get claims within the next two, three days. So what we're telling you is is very important, you need to pay attention. So that's why we do it this way. We try not to train carrier specific because uh, we know that when we bring you back to work, you go, I don't remember any of that. Can you please do that again? Can you guys go through that again? So we we try not to waste their time with that or our time. And, and, and we just do kind of an overview picture of expectations from carriers, multiple carriers and pay setters. What are the demands? What do we expect out of you as an adjuster? If you're in office, what, you know, what, what what's a good, um, presentation and we don't need you showing up with, you know, a tank top and shorts and doing those things. Those, those kind of things that that a lot of times we think that everybody understands, but then you show up at an office and you go, whoa, this guy didn't get the, the memo. Why, what, why is he here? <laughs> right. Um, so it's those things that we try to cover on, on this on this types of uh, meetings and, and trainings that we have. I have a funny story about that. <clears throat> showing up to a cat office. My very first storm, I drove halfway across the country and rolled into the office with board shorts on and a Hawaiian shirt and flip flops that I had literally <laughs> driven straight through. And it was in an office where everybody was wearing red shirts and khaki pants. 
And I open up the door. It's like, I'm here. You know, like, <laughs> you can start now. And it was like, everybody's oh. on their phone and like on the computers or whatever. And everybody, they just looked up at the door at me and it was just dead silent. Like you could hear, hear a pin drop. And they were looking at me like, who in the, they're like, who's going to tell them. Right. And I'm looking around and I see this, this guy, he's like standing there talking to somebody. He does a double take at me points. And then like, does gives me the, you better get your over here finger. And into a side office it went and chewed my rear end up and down. And then that was the last time I ever went into a, a cat office without a storm shirt and khakis and good shoes and a clean, like well-groomed appearance. So that was, uh, that was my very, very first ever storm. And I, when I drove away from that storm after I finished, I, I actually did pretty well on it. I vowed I would never do this again. I was like, no way. <laughs> that was too stressful. And sure enough, next spring I was like, Phone rang. I was like, "Yep, I'll be there." <laughs> yep, when you need that, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, not, can, can you mind talking a little bit about? Uh, do you have a story for me? I want to tell you a quick one. Believe it or not, I used to have long hair. I used to have long hair. And I, I believe it, Cesar. I believe it totally. <laughs> ponytail. Yeah. I did too. I used to have long hair too. Oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> it was <bad. laughs> yeah, and I, you know, no one told me that ponytails were not. You know, you were not supposed to show up with, with the ponies. I mean, it was clean. My hair was clean. It was put away and all that. Same thing. I got called to the side and they were like, look, you can wear a hat if you want, but don't ever show up with a ponytail again <laughs> to any of those meetings. And I was like, well, I'm just going to cut it because I'm, I'm going to forget and I'm going to do it. So um, I say all that to say this. We all don't understand what this environment is and that's why we're getting out there and informing people yeah people that want to get into it they think they hear from somebody else oh i made seventy-five thousand dollars last year and it was great it was the easiest job in the world but they don't tell them the other little things that you have to do to be successful to do these things and and as sydney is doing on social media she's doing a lot of tips and a lot of we're trying to get that message out there look we want to help you, but you got to listen and you got to do these things because not a lot of I, I don't know of any other I firm that has kind of given some of that knowledge back. And we want to be the first ones. We want to be the one. The we want to be the eye of choice because we are going to give you the the real truth. You know, you're the not going to be value. able. To, yeah, the most value for you, Buck. And and at the end of the day, we do want you to work for us. But if you benefit from anything we bring to the table. Take it. It's yeah. yours. Yeah, for sure. And I think I, a lot of times I think folks forget that they're, especially as an independent, like I had the same thing, like I had long hair. I mean, it wasn't super long, but I, I don't think I could put it in a ponytail. But <laughs> I got pulled aside by a manager. He says, I'm not allowed to tell you to cut your hair, but I'm going to tell you that I don't like your haircut, Matt. <laughs> like, message received. <laughs> yes. Um, so, Tell me a little bit about, you guys mind t talking about kind of what sort of like the areas of uh, the topics that are covered in the training that you guys are, are, are putting out? Yeah, I, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so it's kind of broken up into three uh, segments and um, basically starts off with an introduction of what desk adjusting is, what I, the IA world is. It's, it's, it's an introduction of um expectations um how it works how you get compensated how do you get deployed things like that and then uh it goes into um more of a policy um type of training just talking about the different types of policies not specifically but you know like the iso policy and then the policies that are non-traditional that go outside of the iso uh, concept where they create their own policies, things like that, just to give an overview of what they're going to be dealing with. And then uh, the last portion of it is, it's 
they, we go through a scenario on a claim, just a generic scenario, and there's a test at the end, a few questions that talk about policy coverages, just basic things. If you have an endorsement that is ACV only, and you have a $3,000 claim with a $1,000 deductible, uh, we depreciated X amount, what would the payment be? And, you know, little things just to get people thinking outside the box of looking at uh, the overall picture on coverages and things like that. Not real deep, but just more of the, 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 the math portion of how a payment comes about, what elements go into this equation to make that payment. Uh, we feel like that is a, an important portion because a lot of people are not thinking in that in that direction. So when they hear it, they, it's, you can see it. You can see in their eyes, they start to go, oh, okay, that makes sense. So you got to deduct this, deduct that, and the questions come up, right? And that's more of a question driver because people start wondering, oh, what if I have this? You get all those what if scenarios right after that, right? And that kind of makes for a, for a better interaction going back and forth versus having someone over there just dictating this class reading off of a PowerPoint it kind of it becomes in, like an interaction at that point. So we do we start slow and then we kind of ramp it into more of an interaction where it goes back and forth. Okay. Yeah, and we we are going to be offering also um, a field training for new adjusters. And um, Cesar, do you know of any others that Scotty's working on right now? Uh, we got multiple different avenues. We we're going to do new adjusters for field and desk. Uh, we're also uh, training people on the uh, Payset Revolution evil concept. That is a an ongoing um, process. We are going to have that year round, uh, and we'll be sending out dates and posting dates on social media. Uh, we do have one going on this week with a new group. So that is going to be a monthly thing where we train people on the Payset Revolution, on inspection, and also on the writing part. Now on the writing part. We are picking up a lot of uh, seasoned adjusters that have plenty of experience writing claims, but they just don't want to climb roofs anymore. So that portion of it right now is not so much that we're training people on that because that's kind of a difficult concept to train on, right? Uh, every claim is different. So you don't have a blueprint on how to write an estimate. You can give people an idea, but that's going to require more of an experience level. Um, and eventually what we're looking to do is people that train on the field, they may want to be, uh, they might want to be riders. And we also want to make sure that we get training uh, to those folks that, that want to know what happens to that claim, right? I inspected it, but what happens? Am I doing the right thing? We want to cross train those people and make sure that they understand that, that we need additional things from the field and, and they'll get it when they see the product on the other side, when someone's writing it and you, lo you look at a scope sheet and you go, okay, great. I got baseboard here, but how many feet? This photo doesn't really tell me what I need. So it, it, we want to make sure that the people that are taking the field piece understand what the desk needs to complete a file. So there will be some cross training on that as well that that is going to happen eventually down the road as we ramp this thing up and become a or it becomes our, our, our measure platform to handle claims. OK, um, so anything that that. Uh well, let's just focus on kind of new folks. I mean, anything that they can do to prepare themselves so that they're not just, I mean, I would never recommend to somebody to show up to something just totally green without having looked at any of this stuff before, but is there anything that they can, they can show up with that'll, that'll really help them to take advantage of this training? We do have videos that our trainer is putting together for different levels of experience for adjusters. So when we have uh, training and we, have a specific training for new adjusters, uh, and we're going to call it that. This is one-on-one desk adjusting so that we don't have somebody with five years of experience showing up going, man, this is boring. I've already done this. How come you guys didn't tell me this was going to be a one-on-one uh, training class? So we want to make sure that we are very um, specific on what kind of training we're going to offer. And at that point, when we get the list of attendees, we'll be able to route them in the direction where they can start watching videos, where they can start getting familiar with some of the things that they're going to be talking about. So when they hear, um, you know, ACV, 
they're not going, what does ACV mean? What is RCV? What, those things have a lot of value when you don't know what it means and you can be stuck wondering what that means and miss half of the class while you're trying to figure out what ACV means so that you can move forward. At least that was my case because I have to know what they're talking about and I will go research it and I, maybe I'll miss part of it because I was researching the part I didn't understand and now I'm completely lost. So we wanna make sure that they have those tools available even, even after the class when they go home. We wanna make sure that they can go back to that video and say, that makes sense now. Now this video makes a lot more sense. Right, and Scotty also had talked about, um, and Scotty's our trainer. We've mentioned him several times, so I don't know if we've actually introduced him. Um, he had talked about starting to send out some of the training material prior to, like maybe a few days prior to a course beginning, just so they can start to kind of look over it, soak it in a little bit, maybe formulate some questions even before the course starts so that, you know, whenever it does start, especially if it is um, kind of a rookie class, they're not just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, I've never heard any of these phrases before, any of these acronyms before. Um, and so, you know, in addition to the videos that he's making, he has talked about sending out that training material a few days prior to the course beginning. Is there any value for, for, for a newer person to get a little like sort of basic Xactimate training before showing up to something like this? Or are you, are you guys, it's like a one-stop shop, you're covering everything. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro right now uh, no there's always benefit for additional exactimate um training um the more training you have in exactimate the more val valuable you become so as a new person i would recommend that you know maybe sign up for the, some of those classes um or even just research it on youtube there's a ton of videos out there that are free that'll walk you through the process on just how to log in, how to upload, download. When somebody says you got to upload and download, I love, and you talked about this, some of the older folks that are trying to get into this, this industry, you know, after they retired from the previous job and you tell them, hey, I need you to connect and upload and, and download these claims. They have no clue what we're talking about. Uh, and sometimes because we just make the assumption that, you know, They've been in it for a while because they're a little older. We think they have some experience. We we don't have those 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 answers yet. We just assume that they know what they're doing. So I, I do recommend that just a, a 101, just a basic Xactimate training, uh, either through them or the free videos that are that are available. I recommend it because it'll make a world of difference when somebody's talking about. Uh, some of the things that we talk about with Xactimate collaboration and those things, you know, when, when you hear collaboration in our industry it means totally different what it, what it means everywhere else. So, um, right. yes, I recommend it. Highly recommend it. Any value in getting like a level two certification, like going that far with it? I mean, does, does, so does uh, my question, I guess, and it was, is, is Paysetter 
if you see, if you got two exact same resumes and one's got a level two certification on it, are you like, we'll start with this guy or is it that? So with the, yeah, you know, absolutely. With the new environment of claims and we just talked about it, the direction where this is going, you got to be able to write a claim. You got to be able to, um, take a claim from the field and change it if necessary. If, if there is a mistake that needs to be changed right away so that you don't send it back for, for you know, whatever you're requesting, that's just gonna add a delay to that process. And, and when you have somebody with that level of experience that understands and knows how to write a, a, an estimate, a basic estimate, we're gonna pick that person because we know they're gonna be able to take the claim fix it, collaborate it, get it through through the process and, and move it along. So yes, there's a huge, huge amount of value when someone has that experience, specifically now. Right, but it doesn't mean that we're gonna pass up the other person that maybe doesn't have the level two, we would just wanna train that person more. Right, so it's it's really in, in, in an adjuster's best interest to be whether or not they can say, you know, I mean, all a level two certification or level three certification or level one or whatever, all that says is that you've demonstrated proficiency, right? But, you know, from my experience, it's your first, your first cat deployment or your first like claims assignment, that's kind of like your like true job interview, like how well are you doing on your first deployment? You know, whether you had a, a, a level anything certification on your resume or not if you knock it out of the park you know because you you took the time to 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 build yourself you build your skills and improve yourself to show up to the job ready to hit the ground running instead of just saying well i ha i've checked off the, the 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 boxes i got this license that license and that license i got a level one certification but i haven't touched exactimate in nine months and now i'm deployed i'm ready to go i mean that's recipe for disaster um I'm interested to know when the 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 training is going to start, or if it started already, or what what's what's the uh, kind of the roadmap for um, these opportunities for adjusters for training. So right now we have a really a pretty large influx of training inquiries, and on our website um, on the adjuster training page. Um, adjusters can go and fill out a little web form to basically stay in the loop with different trainings that we're having. And um, like I said, right now we're getting a lot of those inquiries. People really are wanting training. That's what we're that's what we're seeing. And so um, it's in high demand. And so right now we're working on getting more scheduled. Like we talked about, the field training is most likely going to be the next one. And it, it may be in Dallas. Um, we don't have anything scheduled yet, um, but we're, we're kind of looking into that. And so um, you'll be one of the first to know whenever we do have it scheduled. And then for adjusters, definitely go and sign up on that um, adjuster training page on our website. And we will stay in communication when we have a storm we might want to also bring the training to that area to enhance what we're doing now uh we do have um yeah you're familiar with it we we have training facilities we have help rooms we just changed the name of that to uh what did we change it to I don't think we have formally changed it. I think well, we were teasing. <laughs> yeah, so we're, 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 we're going to bring that concept to the storm sites as well. We already have training facilities. We used to call them more rooms, but we don't want to call them more rooms anymore because just, you know, the the environment. Yeah, yeah. So we want to change it more of a training facility type, type of concept, but we also want to bring our additional training to maybe towards the end of every storm so that people that may not be working for pay setters at this point, but they're about to be done with that deployment with another IA firm, they have an opportunity to meet us if they want to meet pay setters. If they didn't have a good experience with another IA group, um, we want to bring that to them. We want to give them that opportunity because once you leave and you, I don't, I don't you probably never had a bad storm, but if you had a bad storm with somebody, you go home thinking, this is it. I'm not getting another call. Whatever the circumstances may be, you had a bad storm for whatever reason, you know, you got behind on something and then just kind of snowball effect 
through the whole storm and you were sure. behind the whole time doesn't mean that you were a bad adjuster. You just had a bad storm. And that uncertainty when you go home thinking that you may not get another call, it's a very lonely feeling, especially if you're driving across the country and you're just thinking, okay, I made forty, fifty thousand dollars, but am I gonna get a chance to do it again? So we wanna we wanna make sure that also there is that, you know. Uh, the pay setters is there that look, we get it. You, 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 maybe you had a bad storm, but how can we help you? How can we help you be a better adjuster for the next one? Um, so those are things that we are going to bring to, to the table as well, as we continue to um, enhance how we approach our number one customer, which is the, the adjuster. And I keep saying that, and I know that some people don't share that feeling with me because I'm, I'm business development, right? So I'm supposed to be developing business with carriers, but without the adjusters, I, can't, I cannot even walk into an office and make a promise uh, because we won't live up to it. So first thing is first, I have good adjusters, solid adjusters before I can go get that new client. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm going to put you on the spot, Cesar. <clears throat> um, and you can take a minute to think about this, but okay. do you have any good adjuster stories? And like, I don't mean like, you know, where you <laughs> got into a fist fight with a contractor, although that may be a good, good one. Um, but things like, you know, I had one where, and this is kind of what the, the little gag for this thing is, is like, well, I had this one. Mm -hmm. Cause when you go to happy hour at the end of the day with your adjuster buddies, you're like, man, I had this one today. Um, I was climbing up a, a wood shake roof. It was really steep. And I was going up the, the ridge on one side of it, got up on the roof, did the inspection. And I was, as I was coming down the same way, I had my hands kind of behind the, the ridge cap and it was a newer wood shake roof. Otherwise they probably would just come off of my hand, but I felt on my right hand, I felt this, like, like somebody took a feather and was like rubbing it across the back of my hand. And I looked up and there was wasps all over my hand and I just let go. And I slid down <laughs> to the, hit my feet landed on the gutter. My, the, top, the top rung of my ladder was like flush with the gutter. And I just stopped right there and froze and looked up and I could see him like all buzzing around the, the, uh, the ridge up there and I turned the insured was in the front yard and he was, his face was like, <laughs> <laughs> no, st I didn't get stung once, but that's the kind of thing I'm looking um, for. If you got any stories like that, or, you know, something, some funny kind of story that doesn't, you know, you know, at least the names people anonymous that so they're not, you know, right. I have quite a few, um, some of them probably not something uh, we want to put on that say for work or things like that. <laughs> Maybe not appropriate. Right. Right. <laughs> but I, I got one that's thick that just, it's always there. Um, I had a claim and it was here in Denver. I called the daughter and specifically called the daughter because she's the one that's going to let you in the house. And I was like, perfect. So we set it up for one o'clock. I got there, you know, always 10 minutes early, you know, one of those, so I'm early. So I waited for the 10 minutes, nobody showed up. And I said, maybe they're in the house. So I knocked on the door, uh, just an older gentleman opened the door and he said, you know, and I told him who I was and he's like, yeah, go ahead, do your thing. So I do my thing, I go all the way around and complete the whole thing, knock on the door and let him know that I'm done. And he tells me to go in the house, I'm going the house and I'm going through the whole process of explaining how this works. And in the middle of my whole speech, he says, who in the hell are you? And I was like, okay, wait a minute. So I go through the whole thing again and explain who I was, what I was doing. I'm going through the whole process again. He had it. So he had a medical condition that every 10, 15 minutes, he would forget what was happening. Oh, or no. something like that. I went through, I went through the, I explained the process three times and he stopped me every time, like within 10, 15 minutes into this concept, just explaining. And I was starting to get a little frustrated. I was like, is this guy messing with me? Is he just pulling my leg? So the daughter shows up and she says, I am sorry. I'm running behind. I really do apologize. How many, how many, who in the hell are you? Did you get? I said four. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, hilarious. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I was I was getting pretty frustrated at that point him because it did it. Yeah, he he seemed very normal, and I didn't catch on because he was receptive of all the information and had questions. So I was like, "Oh, this guy's getting it." No, it would just erase, and I would have to start again. So that's, so that's the funny one to have, and I have many, many more. So if you ever put a podcast together where you want to do a just just stories. stories. Yeah, for sure. I'll be happy to be on one of them. Next time I next time you guys are on. I'll tell you a funny one that's really short. I was in it was in Illinois in Chicago and I had a claim in somewhat of a questionable neighborhood, but the street was closed because there was an ongoing basketball game in the middle of the street. And I pulled up, I was a staff adjuster at the time, and I'm driving this minivan but all over the, you know, all over it and, you know, look like an ice cream truck or whatever. So I pulled up and the house is probably half a block away. And I'm thinking, what do I do? I mean, do I honk at them and make them mad and say, get out of the way, stop your game. What do I do? So I pulled up and the only thing I can think of is I got out and I started playing with them. I said, pass me the rock. <laughs> nice. I said, pass me the rock. And they passed me the ball. I That's took a so shot. Amazing. Yeah. And, oh, you know, man. I missed, and the guy was like, oh, you're terrible. I was like, dude, I was like, I, if I would have made it, I would have played with you guys. But, man, I got to get to the house. Is there any way you guys can let me through right now that you got to go chase that air ball that I just shot? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. Nice. <laughs> so they nice. let me through. That was, a, that, was a, that was a funny one. I just had to react right away. I was like, how do I approach this group of people that are obviously were playing for money? There, were, there was money involved in this game. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it worked out really good. I got some fist bumps and you know, it was all good. <laughs> very nice, very nice. I mean, I think every adjuster who's been doing this for a while probably has a similar story. And we we learned to go into certain neighborhoods like before 10 o'clock in the morning, generally, the weekday. Um, but I mean, you know, it's just a reminder that we as adjusters, um, you know, we may have claims on that street and the only time the person could do it is at two o'clock in the afternoon. And you have to figure out a way to to get that claim looked at right and and the person that lives in that house is a customer and they deserve to have you know they deserve to have the, the same service that you give somebody who lives in a different neighborhood um mm -hmm. is you know we're dealing with a cross section of society anybody who's a homeowner and there's people at both ends and everything in between who own homes who pay for this you know to pay for that promise right and so we you know it's challenging sometimes because some neighborhoods, and it doesn't matter really where the neighborhood is. I mean, it could be, you could pull into a neighborhood that looks perfectly safe and normal suburban neighborhood, and then somebody smashed your back window out and grabbed your laptop. You know, it's, it can happen right. literally anywhere. All right, so now if, if people want more information about Paysetter and in particular about this tr the training and getting on the roster and, and getting, um, access to these these opportunities you guys have where can they go um definitely follow us on all of our social media we are on linkedin instagram and facebook um, paysetter claims is our handle on all of those and um, they can go to our website on our home page they can sign up for our newsletter or they can or and they can go to the adjuster training page and sign up for more information on upcoming adjuster training. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.